One would think that modernity and the Enlightenment would be the great period in which all monsters, spirits, devils, and goblins, and gods for that matter, would, after a millennia of their rule, finally go extinct. That rationalism in the new science and social emancipation would certainly spell the doom to superstition, magic, and eventually religion itself would wither on the vine. And yet, it would be precisely modernity and enlightenment values that would provide us one of the most terrifying and enduring monsters of the contemporary period. The vampire. But the vampire of today, from Stoker to Anne Rice to, God forbid, the Twilight series, is a far cry from the earliest vampire reports in history. Let's rewind the clocks before Carmilla, before Varney the Vampire, before Dracula, before Polidori, back to the hinge of the 18th century to explore a few of the first accounts of the living dead preying upon the regular living, and how the vampire craze that erupted in the heart of Enlightenment Western Europe left its mark on both philosophy and theology. I should also mention that Philip over at Let's Talk Religion and I were chatting back and forth about what we wanted to do for our kind of Halloween-themed episode, and independently, we both landed on vampires. So, great minds, demented minds, I think, alike, apparently. So, you should also make sure to go check out Philip's episode on vampires as a kind of general introduction to the topic. Of course, I'll be doing my esoteric thing, diving deep into the early history of vampires and the theological and philosophical impact they would have in the Enlightenment. But also, I often get the question, are you going to cover any Islamic mysticism here at Esoterica, like the Shams al-Marif? The answer, generally speaking, is no, not really. And the reason why is that you can check out Philip's channel, Let's Talk Religion. He covers Islamic mysticism and Islamic occultism and the Islamic occult sciences wonderfully. So if you're interested in that topic, Again, another reason to check out Philip's channel over at Let's Talk Religion. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, or just strange things in history like vampires, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics in esotericism. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics here in esotericism for free on YouTube, I'd hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon with a one-time donation over at PayPal, perhaps. You can use the Super Thanks option below the video, or you can pick up some of our cool black metal style merch over at the store tab. But now, let's turn to the origins of the vampire. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Of course, the vampire legend was not born out of whole cloth. Tales of malevolent spirits that attack the living from beyond the grave are, frankly, ancient. Ditto those of creatures that consume the blood of the living like the ancient Lamia, and even revenants who are said to emerge bodily somehow from their tombs. I mean, even ancient Ishtar threatens to unleash the living dead to consume the living if she's not allowed through the gates of the underworld. Tales like this are extremely ancient. However, None of these beings can be said to be, well, vampires in a strict sense. Even the mysterious term, vampire, borrowed from some very unknown Slavic roots into French through the etymology, as I mentioned, just remains debated to this day, reveals that there probably was no singular ur-vampire legend, that it was a cluster of folklore with regional variants abounding from the Upirs of the Balkans to the Vrykolakas of the Aegean lots of species of the genus of vampire. In some of the legends, the vampire is said to physically rise from the dead and attack the living, often starting out with family members and then fanning out through the community, with those being attacked sometimes becoming vampires themselves. In some narratives, they even attack livestock, and the people that eat that livestock become vampires. 
The nature of those attacks vary from blood drinking, as is common, but it's just as common for them to be strangled or suffocated by the vampire while sleeping. In other cases, the entity is just bothersome, pinching people in the night. In other cases still, the physical body of the vampire remains in the grave the entire time, but a spectral, mystical body goes out on the prowl, somehow mystically filling the vampire's body and even their grave with gore. Though the earliest narratives about the ravenous undead are quite different from these, though just as unnerving. The vampire legend, especially as it becomes increasingly codified through the 18th century, went through a period of rather rapid mutation, so getting back to the earliest legends is quite difficult. However, some of those earliest accounts of the restless dead are primarily not concerned with them rising from their graves to attack the living, but how they actually rose from the grave in some sense and attacked themselves within the grave. Among the earliest collections of vampire accounts, such as the 1679 Dissertatiote Historico Philosophica de Masticatione Mortuorum by the theologian Philip Rohr, and the more famous by the Reverend Michael Raft in his 1734 De Masticatione Mortuorum in Tumulus, both refer to the chewing dead, the dead that chew. These are detailed accounts of the recently buried gibbering, scratching, and grunting like pigs within their graves. Further and similarly disturbing are accounts in which the dead have been exhumed for a wide range of reasons only at that time, that they appear to have somehow gotten free of their burial shrouds. In worse, they've consumed some of those shrouds. In other cases, it's even more disturbing. The dead have gnawed at their own arms, or even partially consume their own, they've even eaten part of their own entrails. Aside from the horrible possibility of premature burial, these texts are theologically worrisome, a sign of the debates that are going to rage through the 18th century about the nature of vampires and their, frankly, theological implications. Note, both of these texts were prepared by preachers, ministers, and theologians with their chief issue here being the premature resurrection of the dead. The dead aren't supposed to come back inside of their graves, at least not, not yet. Of course, the Bible has instances in which the dead are physically returned to life, but the general theological consensus of that time, and now among Catholics, was that such an event will occur only at the end of time, at the final day of judgment. Thus, the physical return of the dead is a theological problem, not, not just a, it's not just like a monster problem. It's worse than a monster problem. Of course, demons. Of course, demons could be generating these sounds to frighten the living, but the physical resurrection remains alarming, as only God Almighty has the power to physically resurrect the dead. Not even Satan himself has that power. Not even necromancy, in some sense, according to strict Catholic theology, has that power. And these mutilations within the grave are by no means demonic illusion and were numerously attested to from a range of frankly bewildered, though reliable sources. Now, most of these early texts adopt a kind of religious naturalism. This would be a period that would really flower in the 18th century. And aspects of this grave chewing could be supernatural or demonically compelled. The dreadful sounds heard within the graves, that could be demons. But these theologians very nearly unanimously reject the full physical resurrection of the dead within their graves. That's just a bridge too far theologically. Rather, most of the mutilations are attributed to insect and vermin predation upon the body. However, Raft does leave open a stranger, much stranger possibility. That is that death itself is a transitional cycle from a sense of being maximally alive, physically, mentally, and spiritually alive, through successive stages of death where the last vestige of life is a kind of purely vegetable existence. This quasi-life at the border of a more absolute sense of death might explain the dead escaping from their burial shrouds and even some of the ravenous behavior within the graves. Here, religious naturalism and some quasi-paracelsian alchemical theories of life and post-life or being undead are brought to bear on those that gnaw within their graves. 
Raft would have revised and expand and even translate his book over the years, and it would go on to become extremely popular, one of the most popular collections of early vampire narratives, thus setting the stage for the vampire craze of the 1730s. But to understand that, we have to explore some of the earliest other vampire cases of that period, some even gathered and published by Raft. Though I will say he also says, what happens? Why can we explain why other people are harmed by these vampires? And he gives the most interesting and elaborate theory of the idea that somehow the imagination of the people that are experiencing the gnawing sounds within the grave, that the imagination is infected by this fear, by these emanations coming out of the grave, and that these can cause widespread shared delusions of seeing the dead roaming around. So it's a kind of infection, but not an infection of vampirism as we'll see later, but a kind of infection coming from the grave into the imagination of all those involved, and this explains kind of the mass hysteria about why people would see the dead returning to them and harming them and throttling them in the night. It's an infection, but an infection at the level of the imagination. However, by even the mid-17th century, the very earliest tales from Eastern Europe, the Balkans and Southeastern Europe, of the dead returning to harm the living were already beginning to trickle into Western European records. Indeed, such legends were probably, frankly, centuries old by the time they were written down in the official records and entered into Western Europe. I'm sure these tales were circulating for centuries, maybe even a millennium. Among the earliest of these tales was a Croatian account of Jure Grando, who perished by some disease in 1656, only to rise from his grave to torment the living for 14 years. For 14 years, they put up with this. Although in that text, he's referred to as a strigon rather than a vampire, something like a wizard, with no reference to him consuming blood or the contagious vampirism that we'll see in later accounts. He would eventually be exorcised on a couple of occasions and, you know, beheaded. His body, however, was strangely undecayed and filled with blood. It let out a shriek when he was finally punctured. And many of these elements would become canonical to the vampire narrative as it would be more fully fleshed out in the 18th century. Though he was able to physically assault people, including his former wife, it appears that the attacks were spectral rather than purely physical after a physical resurrection, his gravesite being undisturbed before his destruction in the account. A similar, even earlier account emerged from Silesia, where following the cover-up of her husband's suicide, the improperly buried man returns in spectral form, but mostly just to bother people. I'm not kidding, he tries to strangle people, but mostly manages just to like pinch them and he blows wind in their faces to, to bother them. However, the ghost does appear more and more frequently, even appearing in the daytime, which is not really a thing you're supposed to do as a ghost. And he's especially troubling to the cobbler's family. And suspecting that he didn't just die of a stroke, as his wife had been telling everybody, the local family actually convinces the authorities to exhume him, now eight months after his death. This well-attended spectacle. A lot of the townspeople, the prominent townspeople, showed up, and they were met with a swollen corpse, blown up like a drum. But oddly, without the typical stench of death, though many of the things we're going to hear now are telltale signs of decomposition, but they were rather extraordinary to late 17th century eyes. Apparently this is things like the growth of nails and the beard, the sheaving away of the outer layers of the flesh, the appearance of a new ruddish flesh. There's even a mole on his toe that was shaped like a rose that apparently wasn't there when he was buried. The limbs were still attached to the body and there was no sign of rigor mortis. Of course, this was all to be expected of a buried corpse, a deeply buried corpse, especially one interred during the freezing months of winter and exhumed in April. Well, the exhumation didn't exactly help matters, and it actually made things worse, and even placing the corpse beneath the local gallows, probably as a kind of symbolic post-mortem execution, that just made him angrier. It would make me angry too. Execute me when I'm dead. So they finally did the rational thing. They exhumed him, cut him into pieces, cremated him, and distributed the body, distributed the ashes so that people wouldn't collect it to do sorcery. It's the rational thing to do. I mean, he didn't even really want to be alive during life, so I guess they gave him kind of what he wanted. 
At any rate, the ghost didn't bother anyone ever again. Here again, it's not quite a vampire as we might recognize. The attacks are spectral, they don't include blood consumption, but those elements weren't long in coming. Get to those in just a minute. However, what is key is the apparent supernatural preservation of the corpse. This is going to be a linchpin issue in vampire narratives, and of course the destruction of the corpse as a means to stop the spectral attacks. Even the rapacious nature of the cobbler's attacks on his wife points to the ravenous sexuality of the vampire as the legend develops, and especially as it gets into the 19th and 20th centuries. But the vampire as we best know them was just about to appear. Oddly enough, it would be a political piece that would open the gates for the vampire to enter into the wider Western world. Concluded in 1718, the Peace of Pasarovitz would brought parts of Serbia and Wallachia out of Ottoman domain and into the power of Austria. The military forces sent to occupy the newly acquired territory began sending back reports of locals exhuming and destroying the bodies of the dead who they alleged were attacking them following their deaths. This was alarming to the local Austrian authorities. With these regions now open to the West, such strange accounts of the living dead were translated from official military reports to medical journals and then they were published as sensational articles in circulation among the fashionable French journals of the Salon and everybody at that Salon was talking about vampires by the mid-18th century. An early such military account is the 1725 case of Peter Plojogovitz. Well, Peter dies, as is pre-vampire custom, only to appear again to various family members by night, strangling them and drinking their blood. And within a week, nine people had died, all apparently suffering from a brief 24-hour illness following the vampiric attack by Peter. The local population implored the new imperial provisor to exhume the body and to look for telltale signs of vampirism. This was not their first rodeo. A custom that we're told actually went all the way back to the period of the Ottoman administration of the region. It appeared that the Ottomans, they were fine with people hunting vampires. Despite some protests, you know, digging people up and cutting their head off and driving stakes through their hearts, it's a common motif in these vampire stories, the, the sort of the idea of the rational person giving in to the superstitious barbaric crowds. And sure enough, they dug the body up and it was found to be undecomposed with skin, hair, and nails grown freshly along with blood, liquid blood, fresh blood in his mouth. Satisfied that Peter had become a vampire and was responsible for all these deaths, the villagers, well, they drove a stake through his heart and fresh blood gushed out of his body. There's even an oblique reference in the story that his corpse had an erection, which is also sometimes part of what happens when you're decomposing. Again, pointing to the rapacious element of vampirism, the idea of this death erection really troubled people. The body was staked, it was then burned in the official ports to make sure to deny any personal responsibility on behalf of the provisor. He doesn't want any part in this nonsense, but he does ask to please inform him if he made any mistakes in the matter. It's a lovely bureaucratic flourish to cap off a rather extraordinary tale, frankly. While the attacks again here remain spectral in this account, Peter never seems to come out of his grave to attack people, all the other principal elements of vampirism are certainly present, and this tale might be one of the first recognizably modern vampire accounts. However, it wouldn't become the most notable. That honor is going to be given to Arnold and Paul, first published in 1732. Again, emerging from the world of the military bureaucracy, along with a strong adjunct of the medical gaze, looking at you, Foucault. The original German reads as oddly matter-of-fact, considering what are ostensibly the facts of the case. The text, now known as Visum et Repertum, seen and discovered, as indicated by the affidavit-like conclusion, opens with the soon-to-become-vampire already knowing his fate, strangely. He's already been infected with vampirism. Fearing himself infected, as I mentioned, Arnold actually has a attempts to solve this. He consumes earth from another vampire's grave. He smears himself in vampiric blood in an attempt to end his vexations. However, he falls off a hay wagon. He breaks his neck. The former soldier is then buried and 
he was doomed to join the restless dead. Immediately following his bury, Paul would go on to directly kill four people, but because he had also predated upon livestock to drink their blood, he had infected numerous other people with vampirism indirectly. They ate some of the flesh of those animals. In all, more than 20 people would directly or indirectly die from his alleged vampiric rampage before, after 40 days following his burial, he was exhumed. Again, undecayed, covered in fresh blood with new skin and nails, the vampire was staked through the heart, causing him to audibly groan and bleed copiously before his remains were cremated. That detail of him groaning is not actually attested to by the people that were there. They weren't there for several years later, but it's made it into the literature. Of course, with vampirism being pestilential, 13 other people would also be exhumed and inspected by medical professionals, of which many people were found to be vampires and were similarly dealt with, from children to the elderly. They went through coffin by coffin looking for vampires. However, others would be normally decomposed, while, like I said, others like the 60-year-old Melisa, who were found in life to be thin, she was thin in her life, was now found to be plumply engorged with blood. Though forensic analysis of the dead said that she was patient zero of the second wave of the infection, having been the first to have eaten of the sheep infected by Paul. This document is, aside from the tale told, also made all the more credible all the more credible by the people that read it and the signatures attached to it. No less than five military and medical officers attest to the truth of all these events, though many of them had actually happened many years prior to their arrival, so there's that. Regardless, the affidavit-like bureaucratic nature of the document had the power to attest to the veracity of all of these events, thus cementing this account in the, in the veracity of the vampire legend. Again, with nearly all of the elements of the lore functioning in this text for the first time, with a special emphasis on the epidemiological, the medical nature of vampirism and the change of the appearance of the undead with the ruddish complexion of the undead, the vampire, as opposed to the typical pallor of the entombed. What's rather outstanding about these earliest accounts of vampire lore is just how different how different they are when compared to later 19th century narratives, much less contemporary narratives with their damn sparkling. Rather than well-dressed, handsome aristocrats, we have peasants. Most attacks are formed through spectral, mystical bodies rather than physically resurrecting and walking around. Throttling, strangulation is just as common, if not more common, than blood drinking as the means of violence committed by the vampires. And they're absent in much of the way of things like shape-shifting, turning into a bat or a wolf or fog or any other supernatural powers. We don't see them much in that way here. And rather than the lean, pale vampire we have in Nosferatu, they're plump, zaftig, and they're ruddish, red with gore, they're consumed, which is consumed at a distance through some weird occult means, which is somehow even stranger than drinking blood from your neck or your chest for that matter. Of course, very many other vampire elements are perfectly here in the lore, especially the post-mortem diagnosis of vampirism, the re-killing through staking and cremation, and the epidemiological character of vampirism as a kind of disease. Further, the accounts are already themselves knocking at the door of theological polemics, as if the vampires were inverse Christs, the consumption of blood, the eating of bread made from vampire blood or graven earth, the 40 days that Paul was in the earth, the resurrection of the vampire after their death, the seeming prolonged afterlife, maybe eternal life given to them, much of which was gained through a relatively sinful life, or at least a sinful departure, like suicide for instance, from this world, and even the mockery of the incorruption of the saints, in Catholic tradition at least, as these creatures gorged themselves with blood in their graves. It wasn't only monstrous, many such monsters and specters abounded, but it was the very concept of the vampire as a theological and philosophically abhorrent matter that such creatures could exist at all, an outrage against especially Catholic Christianity and the naturalism of the Enlightenment. I mean, these creatures are miraculous. That shouldn't be happening in the naturalism theories either. The vampire wasn't only an attack on the peasants of 
Eastern Europe, at the edges of what was Europe at that time, it was also an attack at the very jugular of 18th century Catholicism and rational naturalism. So both Catholics and naturalists had to become vampire hunters. As I mentioned a bit ago, as early as Romft and others, the central problem was the degree to which those that chewed in their tombs, and eventually the existence of vampires properly, was a theological problem for the Catholics. The central issue was to what degree were they alive in their tombs and out prowling about. Central to that issue was both the seeming resurrection from the dead, as I mentioned, but also their existence as a kind of mockery of Catholic theology. Vampires, they were somehow antichrists, anti-priests, and anti-saints all at once. So that wasn't gonna stand. Though I should mention for the Orthodox, the old incorruptibility thing was fine. Excommunicated people, according to their theology, didn't decay. Further, 18th century Catholicism was undergoing a rather radical shift to naturalism, increasingly embracing elements of positivism, especially in the evaluation of miracles. Even one of the great miracle debunkers would, he would eventually become Pope. Thus, the seeming novel existence of vampires was an undeniable test case for this rather modern theological stance. Could Catholic theology weather the problem of vampires? While conclusions varied among theologians, and several, including again, a once and future pope, as I mentioned, would address the topic of vampires, the emergent position was that their physical resurrection simply didn't occur. They were not physically coming back from the dead. Their apparent post-mortem endurance was a natural effect of decomposition, and any spectral effects were either ultimately delusional or demonic vandalism. Maybe the demons could prevent them from decaying at some rate, but they didn't come back from the dead. As for the Protestants, if you're wondering, this vampire craze was basically a non-issue. It was all born of popish or Eastern Orthodox superstition intermixed with a bunch of old peasant paganism. The Protestants didn't ever take any of this terribly seriously. In fact, Protestants just mock the Catholics for taking any of this into consideration in books. The fact that for the Protestants, the idea that Catholics were writing books about vampires was further proof of the stupidity of papistry. The philosophers, too, also were perplexed by the matter of the vampires. The Cambridge Platonists, especially Moore, took the resurrection of the vampire as actually lending possibility to strange survivals of the soul after normal death. He accepted the possibility they were coming back from the dead physically. Indeed, some of the final vestiges of historical Paracelsians actually lent their theories and not a little occult philosophy to explaining the sudden appearance of the vampires during the craze of the 1730s. In fact, Voltaire, Voltaire, that Voltaire even seems to note, perhaps in frustration, that all anybody talked about in the 1730s was vampires. So, goth clubs? Meet 1730s vampire salon discussion scene. In general, there were very active debates about the nature of life at this time from the radical me mechanists, people like the post-Cartesians with their sort of ghost in the machine theory, to various vitalists and even more occult theories still. Exactly what life was and when did it end was interesting at this time. It's interesting in our time. Are viruses alive? For the post-Cartesians, the vampire might be a test case, as if they held that human beings were different from other creatures and that they were machine bodies driven by conscious souls. Were machine bodies driven by conscious souls located infamously in our pineal gland. That's where your soul is, according to the Cartesians. Were the vampires human? Were they driven by thought and will? Or were they mere mechanism driven like animals by their insatiable drive for blood, simply motivated, willful shells of former human beings. One might even imagine a movie in which some Cartesians set out from France into the wilds of Wallachia to capture a vampire and then run tests on it to see if they can prove their philosophical convictions, whether they're really animals or humans or... Andy, you watching this? This is a good, I think it's a good attention film. Other philosophical positions held that the physical body of the resurrected vampire must be linked to the mystical body that roams about, attacking the living and somehow remotely draining their blood, even spreading their vampirism through some means of epidemic. This was a strange idea. How did they get the blood in their graves? But if one adopted a purely naturalistic theory, what explains the resurrection of these creatures? How could they come back to life after being dead? How could they be trapped in those tombs and still roam about? And if one rejects this, 
then how do you explain all the scores of apparently trustworthy reports flooding into Western Europe from the 1720s through the 1750s? With germ theory more than a century away, alchemy not yet extinct, and the new science in its infancy with radical opinions abounding about what could be going on here, the first major task of the Enlightenment, if you believe this, one of the first major tasks of the nascent Enlightenment was to deal with, of all things, the emergence of the vampire and its philosophical implications for everything from the Cambridge Platonists over there in England, early modern occult philosophers, the sort of early emergence of neo-occultism, and the twilight of Paracelsianism, to the radical positivists and the mechanists. Everybody had a dog in this fight, a vampire in this fight. One even gets a taste of a first-hand report on the topic as the botanist de Tefort looks down his nose at the islanders of Mykonos as they seek to seek out and destroy a dangerous, though not blood-sucking, southern European species of vampire, the Vrykolakas. His eyewitness account of the dissection of this creature makes for wonderful, gruesome reading, but definitely not at all for the squeamish. By around 1720, what began as bureaucratic military reports on recently occupied lands had become a topic of near universal interest through Europe. The vampire had er really arrived in earnest. What developed was a feedback loop. Local military reports got the interest of regional doctors. Those lurid reports inspired conversations when published in fashionable salon journals, which prompted further investigation. Those investigations, of course, discovered more vampires, and this feedback loop in various places through Europe, reports of Eastern vampirism exploded through the 1750s, well after the military occupation of the region ended in 1738 or so. The vampire was simply here to stay. Of course, this logic is so structurally similar to the witch hunts with credulous investigators and righteous vampire hunters next to the further credulous armchair theologians and philosophers way off over there in France, it's not hard to think of the vampire craze as a mutation of the witch craze. You had a preconceived notion of witches, you went and found them through torturing people. You had a preconceived notion of vampires, you found them once you exhume graves and don't really understand what's going on in germ theory and decomposition. Recall that executions for witchcraft were still occurring in the late 18th century with even a few spurious cases in the early 19th century in Prussia. They overlap in some sense, the witch craze and the vampire craze, and in this way I suspect that the witch and the vampire share some deep structural relations sociologically. They certainly were in the minds of the people at this time. Think of the witch as causing pestilence and the vampire causing pestilence. I think what happens here is you people traded the witch for the vampire. These early military medical reports, reprinted in learned journals and fashionable journals, as I mentioned, would reach their culmination in Calmet's treatise on the apparitions of spirits and the vampires or revenants of Hungary, Moravia, etc. First published in 1746, but heavily updated in several editions, especially the vampire editions. He really, really updated the vampire editions. Here's a copy I have that's actually going to be for sale in my... Um, new catalog. In some sense, this is the definitive textbook on vampires of the period. The entire second half of the book is dedicated to vampires, and it's actually just one of the best collections of ghost stories as well. The whole first part's about ghosts and magic and demonic possessions and demons and things. It's fantastic. The priest scholar Comet is, at least in the first edition, more open to the possibility of the reality of vampires as a kind of divine punishment. But as more reports come in, he becomes increasingly unconvinced and eventually rejects them as theologically impossible. God is not punishing people with this at any rate. However, as he gets on, um, later he wrestles really with the range of possibilities concerning vampire accounts, and I would say that he struggles between a profound skepticism of this is possible to really being sympathetic to the accounts at his hand. He really takes them as seriously as possible. Voltaire mocks him for this. This dialectic creates a real tension in his work, really making it read as much of a dissertation, frankly, as a kind of mystery novel with the more horrible potential outcomes. The, the reality of the living dead, a lot rests on this book, theologically, philosophically, monsterological. It's no wonder the book went into wide editions. It was widely popular. It went into numerous editions and was translated into several languages, including English. You can get the great English translation of 1850. 
The wide reach of this work was further cemented. The vampire and his dissertation became the foundation for the industry of vampire fiction that would emerge starting in the early 19th century, of course, including Dracula. Stoker certainly read this book, at least in the English translation. Of course, the vampire would not only be the last monster of the Enlightenment and modernity, that's probably biological, chemical, and atomic warfare, nor even the most dangerous, but in some sense, being the first monster of this period, it's no wonder that such creatures have had such enduring power in imagination, art, literature, film, lifestyle, frankly. The vampire's here to stay. The best and most accessible recent history of vampires is Nick Groom's work, which is vouched for by Ronald Hutton. So if you're around here, you know about Ronald Hutton. He's the goat. And that's a gold seal around here for sure. So pick up Groom's work. If you want to check out some of the earliest vampire accounts and translation, the absolute best test there is Barber's Vampires, Burial, and Death. Though I have to admit to you, some of the sections are at all not for the squeamish. If you're not a fan of body horror, you might want to read that one. The bibliography, however, is just great for just primary sources around vampire literature, although you need to learn to read some other languages. Speaking of which, if you read German, you can access many of the original documents in their original German, in Sturm und Vokus von den Vampiren. If you, again, if you really want to get into the bureaucratic nature of those early military reports, then they really, they hit different in the original German. Of course, Karl Metz on the apparitions of spirits and vampires remains an absolute classic. If you can get a reprint, make sure to get the expanded edition, like the or later 1750s editions in French. Or if you get the English edition, you can get the translation of 1850. That's the more complete edition. It's just an occult classic, and you need to have it on your shelf. It's far better, frankly, than Montague Summer's books on vampires. Summers just leans very heavily on Calmet, so just go back to Calmet. All the go... Montague Summer's books are quaint and wonderful in their own creepy little weird way. I only wish for myself there were a solid collection of the early vampire tracks and critical editions. To my knowledge, Ronth's On the Chewing Dead doesn't have a modern academic edition. It may not even have a modern edition at all, which, if I'm correct, that's a real pity. I doubt I'm done with vampires. I'm sure I'm going to be interested in coming back to the more deep, more esoteric elements of how vampirism affected uh, theology and philosophy at this time, and it gets us right up to the limit of where esoterica focuses, right up to the limit around the turn of the 1800s. So in that way, it's a kind of a wonderful bookend for the channel in a general way, though we, we make forays. We make, we make forays into the 19th and 20th centuries from time to time around here, but there's just something about reading like how in Calmet's book, he's just wrestling so much with the vampire as an issue of philosophical, spiritual, technological. People forget Dracula. It's a highly technological book. If you read that text, all that technology there is brand new. Blood transfusions and the cinemonograph and the, uh, the wax cylinder recorders that uh, the doctor, you, Dr. Seward, uses to record. It's more science fiction as it is horror. So at any rate, I'm sure I'll be coming back to the vampire in due time. And again, if you want a copy of this wonderful text by Calmet, this is an 18th century edition, 1746, if I remember correctly, I'll be having it in my uh, winter catalog for sale. But more on the vampire soon. Until then, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.